controversial topics with me and the Rav Jor. I'm hope, hoping that uh, Rod will join us at some point here. We want to let everybody know that uh, we're dedicating this class tonight to Lule Nishma um, Linda Marie Bat Joseph, or in Hebrew, Shifa Ruth Bat Yosef. Um, and there we are. Um, I'm also going to ask for your prayers for my sister, for Rufua Shlema, Liba Bat Hinda. Uh, my sister's in the hospital in Florida with a blood clot in her lungs. So, Bizlat Hashem. Um, God um, will hear, hear our prayers and give her a complete healing. So, what would you like to talk about? Tonight. I uh, I got them I got a, a, a message from um, from I don't know a friend of ours mm -hmm. that um, that kind of kind of like um, he heard one of my classes that I was talking about uh, like the faith of of um, of certain people in uh, in Jesus and mm -hmm. I explained that um, based on our tradition based on our sources. Um, we know that um, he was not Mashiach ben David, and he's not Mashiach ben David that we are waiting for. And mm -hmm. then that friend um, of ours, he sent a message. Um, okay, it's very nice that you explained that he's not Mashiach ben David, the Mashiach, the son of King David. Um, but we believe that he was Mashiach ben Yosef. So I kind of... Um, Wanted to hear you mainly. I have my thoughts about it as well, but your um, experience and knowledge and uh, and wisdom on that topic is way wider than mine. I wanted to hear from you, like if possible, to illuminate the eyes of our students around the world on that subject because it's very controversial. Like some are saying, like, "Hey, it's God Himself," and then they're saying, "No, it's not God. It's the Messiah." Mm -hmm. Oh, it is God, and it's the Messiah. Like you have, like Ben David, Ben Yosef, with a father, with no father, because of his mother. Not like, can you make some order <laughs> into that mess? So, so it's going to be a very short uh, podcast then, if I if I give you my answer. And the reason I say that the is... answer is no. I cannot <laughs> answer. <your question. laughs> no. I won't explain it. No, that's not the answer. The answer is that I can explain it in about 10 seconds. And what's funny about it is that most people, uh, and here's the funny thing, most Jews, most observant Jews, even most knowledgeable Jews miss this point. It's a very subtle point, but they miss it. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Shay earlier and he asked, he, he said to me, you know, what is Rev. Jor suggesting? And I told him, and he said, well, what's your take on that? And I said, well, let me give you my 10 second answer. And he said, wow. He goes, that's amazing. I've never heard that before. And he goes, it makes so much sense. That's why I said it's a short class. Now, I will tell you this. I'm, I I'm, have... I'm asking, I just, okay. I'm, I'm asking, I think that for the, like, for the, for, I'll make it longer. For the satisfaction of our students, I want to say why. Because I think that many people grew up in certain communities mm -hmm. and they have their knowledge, like only what they've been taught in their church or in their like community. Yeah. And that's what they know and that's what they think that is right. And they're not even open. Maybe they are now, maybe if they're following and listening to us, maybe they're now like a little bit more open to hear that first of all, there are different opinions, and then maybe that also that there is a great contradiction on, on all or, or on most. Okay, so I, I will say this at the beginning, and if I had known and I had a little bit more time, and I'm sorry for moving around, but sometimes I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Um, people don't know I have very bad back issues and pain issues. Anyway. I will say that I have a video that I did that's probably about an hour and a half long, which is called Mashiach Ben Yosef, where I went through all of the Jewish sources um, explaining this very question because I was asked so many times or had so many times people come back and say the same thing that they said to you, which is, 
Okay, great. So you're saying he's not Mashiach ben David, but he's Mashiach ben Yosef. And so I did a video, like I said, and I, I, towards the end, I can probably direct people to where it is if I remember myself where I have it uploaded. Well, in the, like in in a couple of days from now, we can also post it on our on the right. Muna, um, social yeah. media, and then people can like check it in a couple of days yes. and uh, and find it as well. So we can do that. Um, so here, I'm going to give you the 10 second answer, and then we can talk about it in much more detail. The 10 second answer is this, okay? We know that Mashiach ben David has to be from, through the through Yehuda, through the tribe of Judah, through David HaMelech, through his son Shlomo HaMelech, right? Very simple, we know that. Now, why is Mashiach ben Yosef called ben Yosef? Because he's from Yosef. So he has to be from one of the tribes from Yosef. Therefore, you can't have one person who's Mashiach that comes from two different tribes. And that's the 10 second answer to this that most people miss. You can't say that, oh, he's come now as Mashiach ben Yosef, as the suffering servant, but then when he returns, he's going to come back as Mashiach ben David. Because if he comes as Mashiach ben Yosef, then he has to be from one of the tribes of Yosef. And if he's from one of the tribes of Yosef, then he can't be from the tribe of Yehuda. He can't come back from, you can't have one individual that's from two different tribes. That's the 10 second answer. I hear you. And um, the, I, I remember reading, learning about that the tribes are being set by the father while yes. the religion is being set by the mother is it is that like can you give us like some explanation yes. on that so so it's interesting that you're saying that because my sister you know was just here in israel my sister who i'm asking for prayers for she was just here in israel for five weeks and she went back after pesach she loves to watch TV and she, she loves to watch these shows. They're coming out with all these shows now, um, like reality shows related to Orthodox Jews. You know, they have uh, this one crazy lady that, uh, you know, uh, they did a reality show with. Now they have a new reality show called Jewish Matchmaking. So they have a Shad Chanit from here in Israel that's that's doing a reality show, putting people together in Miami, in Los Angeles, in Israel, whatever. And my sister called me on Zoom the other day before she got sick. And she said, she goes, they, they, they were trying to put people together, but it was hard because the one guy was Fardi and the girl was Ashkenazi. And she was asking, what are we going to do on Pesach? Are we going to eat kidneyot? Are we not going to eat kidneyot? And then my sister said, she goes, I didn't realize, she goes, and, and, and they said that Svardim, you know, she, she brought up that idea of that the tribes and also how you follow is based on that as well. Like, in other words, um, if your father was Svardi, then you take on Svardi Min Hagim. Min Hag is based on the father as well. It's based on the father as well, the same way that the tribe is. And... Um, you'll see that um, the the. So how I can believe, we? So how can Hosea, we? I believe it's in Hosea. If you look at the Navi in Hosea, I don't remember off the top of my head the ver the exact chapter and verse, but in Hosea it talks about this. It talks about the idea of Judaism coming through the mother, because it talks about um, non-Jewish fathers and how you know. Um, so, so it's very clear that the um, Judaism is set by the mother. The Judaism is set by the mother, and tribal lineage is set by the father. So I'm asking myself, based on what Christian people are assuming that he is related to any tribe, if to their theory, he his mother was conceived by the spirit. Right. So right. it's like, how can uh, how can he be related to any tribe? He he can't. And then and then the argument comes up is what do you do do in a situation of, um, like in other words, if you're going to say that Yosef 
you know, in in their in their literature, where you know, supposedly this man Yosef took, you know, Mary or Miriam as his wife, and supposedly became the father. The question is, can you argue? Is, are there sources that would show that he could take on that lineage of of Yosef? But then it becomes an issue because still, even if you could say, even if you could argue that Yosef was from the tribe of Yehuda, even if you could argue that, then then the best you could say is Mashiach ben David, possibly, which we don't believe. But then you discount his ability to be Mashiach ben Yosef. Now, if we go back to this idea of Mashiach ben Yosef, where do where do our where do Chazal get the idea of Mashiach ben Yosef. Well, of course, one of the main chapters that we see is Isaiah 53, which the Christians consider that their nuclear bomb. You know, it's like, look, they show Jews, look at this. Who could this be talking about? You know, he took on our iniquities and our pain and he suffered and he was beaten. And, you know, the truth is that Isaiah 53, first of all, we have to understand that there was no such thing as chapters and verses <laughs> when right. these things were written down in scrolls. When you and I go to Beit Knesset, when we go to a synagogue and we're called for an aliyah to the Torah and the the, the Baal Kore is reading, it doesn't say Vayikra Leviticus chapter 12, verse 6. You know, he's reading in Hebrew in a particular Nusach Without vowels, without anything, without, you know, he doesn't even have the tropes, the, right. the cancellation marks. Right. So, so we know that there were no chapters and verses. But if we're going to look at these stories, the idea of the suffering servant starts off in chapter 52, not in chapter 53. And one of the things that it talks about is that the kings of the nations would be astonished at this suffering servant. This is considered what's called the fourth servant song in Isaiah, because if you look prior to this in Isaiah, there are three other what are called servant songs. And in two of those three, the people of Israel are identified as that suffering servant. So this idea of the suffering servant being B'nai Israel, the Jewish people, and the kings of the nations being astonished of course, they're astonished by this little nation that no matter what happens, no matter how we're, no matter what country we're kicked out of, no matter how we're kicked down, um, no, no matter how we're attacked. I remember when I was in third grade, in third grade, I'll never forget this. I had a teacher who was Jewish, Mrs. Gunther, in third grade. And it was during the time of the Six Day War. Okay, when I was in third grade, it was the Six Day War. And she pulled down a map in front of the class and she showed what Israel looked like on the map. And she said, look at this little tiny postage stamp of a country that's surrounded by all its enemies. And no matter what happens, it still survives. It still exists. And I never forgot that to this day. Seven and, countries, seven uh, countries de decree the war on us in, uh, at the same time, surrounding us from all directions. And the, and the maker of the universe just uh, opened the sea for us again. So, so that suffering servant. So now here's, here's a very another interesting thing. If you look at Isaiah 53, which also, you know, not that we want to destroy people or we want to destroy their arguments. It's very good that you use the term illumination. I like that because too many people um, that are, uh, counter missionaries or anti missionaries are looking to destroy people's faith. They're looking to destroy people's arguments. We're not looking to do that. We're not looking to destroy anybody's faith. We're not looking to destroy anybody's path. What we want to do is illuminate you so that you are properly connected to the creator of the universe um, so that you can make the most of what he has to offer and you can become the most that he wants you to be. Um, so if you look further in that chapter, what does it say? It says about the suffering servant in 
in in the idea of being buried in the grave, it says in his, and the Hebrew is in the plural, in his deaths. With an S. Not death, singular, but deaths. Okay? Because we're talking about B'nai Israel. Right. Now, go down to, to verse 10 or verse 11. It, it might be different in the English, in the Christian versus the, the you know, the Hebrew. It's verse 10 or 11. And it says, as a result of this suffering servant being Asham, okay, and this, this concept of Asham, which has which is related to guilt, can be interpreted. Sometimes it's con, it's considered, it's interpreted as, as a guilt offering. One of the offerings in a temple was an Asham. Right. Or it could just be the concept of guilt. But it says, as a result of this servant being Asham, two things happen, right? He will have zera, he will have seed or offspring and length of days. Two things that Jesus didn't have. Okay, now, every time, and, and so before, I'm going to preempt this because sometimes people say, well, spiritually, no, 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 no. Zera, if you know anything about Hebrew, study the word zera and zera always, completely. Always means physical offspring. It has nothing to do with spirituality. So the idea of zera that this this it's like prosperity, it's in the right. in this world, right? This entity that will be a sham that will either take guilt upon itself or be a guilt offering will have zera, will have physical offspring, and will have length of days. So when you take all of these things together, this concept of Mashiach ben Yosef having to be from the tribes that originated from Yosef. And when you take into consideration that the sufferings, because what they will do is they'll point not only to Isaiah 53 for their purposes, but this is what Chazal use. Our own sages use Isaiah 53 as the, the, the chapter to describe why we believe in a Mashiach ben Yosef, in a Mashiach that's going to suffer. There's no question that they do that. That's why I say the 10 second version. You know. I, I, I want to I wanna say, first of all, it's very educative and I'm, 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 thank you so much. I, I wanted to ask another thing just because my curiosity, like my logic is to consider those conversation with like with a very serious um, attitude. Like I, I hear we have our own testaments uh, that are ancient, like over 2,000 years ago from the Gemara about um, about what had happened in those days and, and, and all the history. We, we have those scripts written. Mm -hmm. um, um, but um, I'm wondering, after like talking about Christianity like that in a serious way and checking sources and, and talking about it with great like honor and respect, like trying to figure out what's, what's really going on, um, how did they came up with um, with uh, with the new holidays that they are celebrating now? Like, what is Christmas and what is Halloween? It's those are also two Christian holidays, right? So not so much Halloween. Halloween, you know, Christmas actually. I think really more originated from a Catholic, um, you know, from, from uh, Catholicism, um, which sort of you have to separate out, which I didn't know. Like when I was growing up, you know, when I grew up, you know, and I went to, you know, my Orthodox synagogue in Brooklyn, in New York, we, we didn't know from anything other than Catholicism. I thought the Christianity Everybody was Catholic. I didn't know that there were other things. I didn't know there was such a thing as Baptists or Lutherans or Methodists or, you know, or, uh, you know, uh, Protestants or, you know, Charismatics or Messianic, you know, Hebrew Christians. I didn't know anything about that. So I think the, the you know, the, the origins come more from Roman Catholicism than anything else. Um, Halloween, I'm, I'm not so... You know, that I think came from something called All Hallows Eve, 
And I'm not so sure of the origins of whether or not that has. So not you know, so. So only part, only 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 uh, only um, part of of Christians are celebrating those uh, those holy days. Like not not everyone are celebrating. Uh, I don't think Christmas. most. So so I I can tell you that a lot of. You know Christians that are more on the side of. Uh, you know, that would call themselves, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know, like the, you know, ones that call themselves like born again Christians. They tend to like not want to do anything related to Halloween. They'll do like, you know, um, like at their churches, they'll do things like a fall festival, you know. Um, you know, they won't, they won't do anything with like... Um, with uh, costumes or things like that, you know, they'll have like, you know, something, they'll have something to replace that holiday, but in a way like not to deprive the children of something, which sort of, I never understood. It's like, it's sort of like people that eat turkey bacon, you know, it's like, you know, Jews that eat turkey bacon. It's like, you know, you're like bacon is trafe. But you, you know, you like maybe you're a Balchuva and you remember what bacon tasted like. So, you know, it was so good that you need to have turkey bacon now. You know, it's like, you know, it's to me, it's easier to teach your children that we don't do this because it's a Vodazara, you know, because it's strange worship rather than giving them a replacement for it, you know, yeah. because you want them to still get candy and, you know, and be able to dress up or you know, whatever it is. The Christmas thing, I don't know. Christmas, Christmas to me has become so commercialized. And I mean, you saw it getting to live in in, uh, in the U.S. for a few years, you know, going there. And I remember, I remember how much grief you took from the first year when we sent you to the U.S. And uh, you were there maybe only a few months. And, uh, you know, People, I don't think people understand that in Israel, we don't have these kind of things in Israel. There's no such thing as a Walmart or a Costco or anything like that. And I, I don't think they understand that you as an Israeli that, that grew up here that has never seen anything like that before. You and, and your wife and, and the five boys going into a place like that and being hit in the face with, you know, with like just the lights. With the lights and the, the trees and the you know the decorations and everything else, it, it had to be like crazy overwhelming. And so you as a joke put on a hat, you know, and and, and you, oh, if you remember you, what I said. All hell, all Gehino broke loose, all hell broke that's, loose. No, but why? Again, like the main question I had back then is to the Orthodox Jews, like why are you so afraid of Christmas? Not because yeah, like, I mean. find something over there. Like for me, definitely it's it's zero. Like I like I have no relation to it. I don't even have the knowledge of 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 it. Like you just I ask you, but like I find it kind of funny that Jewish people will be so scared of like oh no you cannot like people are not strong in their faith enough. Um, to just say no, like you said, like you don't want to eat. Uh, um bacon so say no to bacon you don't need to right. imitate and to replace it with something else like turkey bacon like you if right. you don't eat bacon you don't eat bacon that's it it's like you don't eat pork we don't eat pork so right. it's like so clear to me but I, uh, so that's what i ask why why are you so afraid of christmas like you know so the ones who are fearing christmas went uh, went uh, <laughs> went nuts on me you know what? It's I, I think that this is a that it brings up a very good point and something that I think I'd like to talk about on a future show. Because when you talk about this idea, you know, you and I I shared with you some of my struggles that I've been going through over the past couple of weeks. And I was sharing with a friend of mine, and we were talking about this 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 subject. And when you just brought this up, this idea of fear, um, this friend of mine stopped in the gallery last week and he said to me, he said, you know, sometimes I feel like um, I don't portray to people who I truly am. He said, I almost feel like I wear a mask sometimes. 
Now, I work with another rabbi, Rabbi Gedalia Flair, who's uh, you know a f- pretty well-known Breslov, you know, rabbi. He's been around. He's 83 years old now, and he's getting ready to do a whole seminar on uh, authenticity. And uh, and one of the things that he's you know he talked about in in discussing this idea was um, this idea of he he said why are there so many people that are um, uh, what's the word I can't think of it but it was this whole idea of masking so the reason the whole point I'm bringing this up is because I believe that most people that are afraid are afraid because they're they do so much ritualistically and yet there's no real connection and and the real connection is not there because they have never connected with who they really are which is something that you talk about a lot you know it's something that Rabbeinu, the Rebbe Nachman talked about about the nikudot tovot and this idea of you know looking for that that point of truth or that inner point of truth most people that I see today that are walking around that are afraid, that are like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. And, you know, you need to, you know, they go and they put on tefillin and they put on tzitzit and they go three times a day and they go all these things. And then they go home and they beat their wives and they yell at their kids and, you know, whatever. They don't know who they are. And their fear comes from the fact that they've never, they, they don't have a real connection I'm going to say it. I don't think they have a real connection with the creator only because they don't have a real connection with themselves. There, I said it. You want to talk about controversial? Throw tomatoes at me now. Or you think, will not use it or listening. I think that uh, I'm going to spare the, the tomatoes for uh, my children for tomorrow's morning's uh, <laughs> breakfast. But uh, I wanted to say something. I think that that fear is um, coming. I just want to clarify something to put a mark on what you said just explaining in a deeper way i think that um when you don't have a solid inner connection and your faith is not independent is not on its own not based on your own life experience and knowledge of understanding like yeah there is a maker like that's it i'm not moving away from him ever again because like i saw him i know him i believe in him i feel him i can sense it and all your faith is based on traditional things, just like because someone is telling you, because someone forced you to, then you always live in fear that if you wouldn't have a supportive surrounding community, you will lose your Judaism. Mm-hmm. So then your Judaism depends in other people to agree with you, to support you, whatever. And then you also become so hard on your children to force the surrounding to close on them, for them not to slip out, for them not to fall off the derech, for them not to go. But if you would put your focus on like inspiring them from within, like connect yourself to the maker, talk to him on daily basis, like you can smell him, you can see him, you can taste him. Like when you eat food, it's uh, the flavors are, are angels of Hashem. When you when you see those sights, it's like Hashem is brightening your eyes. If if you would not, if you are not working on building that, it's as if you don't have anything. But if you would work on that, definitely there's no reason to be scared of anything because like Hashem is with you. And even if Hashem commanded you not to follow any Christian or foreign customs and holiday, like, first of all, we're not. And second, we're not because we don't want to. And not uh, like we want to serve Hashem, not because we're afraid not to. We're serving Hashem out of love and not because of our fear. We we admire that's, it. That's the most amazing part because wh- how did he create the world? He created the world in that same way, out of altruism. He, he didn't create the world out of you know anything else other than a desire um, to show love, to show mercy, to show, you know, um, to show of those good aspects of who he is as the creator. And that's all he wants us to do in the only way. It's like, you know, when people talk about being off the derech, you know, like you just talked about off the derech. When I walked away from Judaism, though, so many years ago, I didn't walk away from, I didn't walk away from Hashem. 
I walked away from organized religion. I walked away from organized religion because I saw it as inauthentic when we're talking about authenticity. Um, For me, it was inauthentic. I wanted to have a real relationship with the creator. I didn't want a relationship based on somebody telling me, you need to do this, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. You know, it's like I was in a hospital bed with a pin drilled through my leg with a brace on that pin in a cast with ropes holding my leg up in the air with weights on the outside of the bed, holding my leg up in the air to keep it immobile um, in a hospital a ward with six or seven other people with a guy next to me handcuffed to the bed because he had tried to rob something, you know, in this hospital ward. And the only thing, the only thing that people thought to bring me when they came to visit was tefillin and a talit and a siddur to make sure that I was davening three times a day. This is why I walked away. (laughs) Not because um, I I walked away from Hashem. And this is why so many of us, this, why do you think, you know, these are so many things that, that, that will bring us to new topics that we can talk about. Why do you think there's such a movement today towards chasidut? Why has Rabbi Nachman become so popular? Why are so many people that, that have yeshiva backgrounds that, you know, that would never in, 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 in a million years have learned any of these things now or like studying Lakute Maran and, 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 and connecting to Rabbeinu? Why? Why? Because people are looking for a way to connect, to have a conversation, to, you know, Shay was talking about how, how he came to Tzfat and he was the Kever, Kever Arizal and he's talking about these guys going to the mikveh and screaming and yelling. And I said, you, you, you have no idea what it's like for me to have to hear them screaming and yelling, you know, at the top of their lungs, you know, Abba, Abba, and like, like Hashem can't hear them. And I said, What's the most powerful thing in the world that Rabbi Nachman talks about is the silent scream. The silent scream is even more powerful than anything that you can mouth, you know, um, you know, with words. So anyway. Okay. Aya, thank you so much. It's um, already our time is up. Ah. And Bezat Hashem, we're going to see each other again. Um, God willing. Thank you so much for brightening our eyes and sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And hopefully we're going to speak more about this uh, very interesting topic. We just really want to share with people that um, the the libraries of, um, of books of truth are open wide and everyone can, uh, can learn authentic and original <clears throat> scripts that were never twisted by, uh, by people and were just given to us by the maker and um, and his uh, prophets, the true uh, sages. And um, I think that a great recommendation when people are not so, um, like they don't know Hebrew, so they cannot read the original scripts, is to try to read um, the translated Bible or um, any um, Jewish scripts that are translated by Orthodox people because they will definitely put all the effort not to change anything, any letter, not to move a thing from the source and then you will not suffer from mistranslations and wrong and twisted explanations in the verse themselves, the, themse- the verses themselves. Um, you will just enjoy reading the honest translation of the simple words that were given to us by the Maker Himself and His prophets, and not by men, not hand, ma- man-made. Wow. I know. I'm just. I, I'm, I, my eyes were drawn to somebody posting something on the chat overlay, and I just okay. sort of laughing to myself because he talks about us reading the blasphemous book of Enoch, which. 
no Jew reads, by the way. And, and if he wants to talk about people reading the Gospels, probably what I've forgotten about the Gospels, he hasn't even learned yet. So because the same way that uh, that you're talking about people being able to read Hebrew, most Christians can't even read the original Greek. So I usually tell these people when they come to me and talk to me, do you speak Hebrew? Do you understand Hebrew? Can you read Hebrew and translate it? No. Can you read Greek? Can you understand Greek and translate your own from the original? No. I said, all right, go get an education, learn Hebrew and Greek, and then come back and we'll talk. Okay. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I love you, brother. Thank you. We'll okay. talk with Take us. Care. Thank you so much.